This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode I chat with the world's best writers and creatives about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now today, I chat with Christopher Landon, the film director, screenwriter, and producer known for films such as Disturbia, Happy Death Day, Freaky, and Paranormal Activity. Now his latest release, We Have a Ghost, will be coming to Netflix in a few days on February the 24th. It is perhaps his most family-friendly film, but is no less excellent, and this one includes some incredible physical acting from David Harbour, and so much nuance and social commentary within the film. So with that said, it is almost time to get to our conversation. But first, a quick advert break. Hey horror fiends, it's Tim Levin here from the UK. I'm delighted to be an author guest at Horror on Main. Really hope you can join us there. It's gonna be a lot of fun. It's going to be scary. There's going to be lots of books for sale. Oh, it's going to be glorious. So I hope, really hope to see you there. I'm looking forward to it so much. Be scary. Keep reading. Be safe. Horror on Main, a new weekend convention for the horror community. We've been going to conventions for over 20 years and are changing up the little things to make the big picture amazing. Join us Memorial Day weekend 2023 in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Come to the block party and meet your new neighbors. See horroronmain.com for details. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them, and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The girl in the video is the ring meets fatal attraction for the iPhone generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. Well, without further ado, it is Christopher Landon on This Is Horror. Chris, welcome to This Is Horror podcast. Hi there. I know, to begin with, let's talk about any early life lessons that you learned growing up. And it doesn't necessarily have to pertain to writing or filmmaking, but just anything that you learned during those formative years. I mean, I think, I mean, look, I started, I started watching horror movies when I was really young. Um, inappropriately young, some might say. Um, (laughs) But I think what I learned was that horror was a really safe space, you know, to sort of deal with any sort of fear or anxiety that I might have, you know. Um, And so I think that's why I was always drawn to the genre um, at an early age, because it was like, oh, okay, I feel better after I watch this stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Which sounds weird, but it was true. (laughs) I think that happens with a lot of us and I think really there's something cathartic and comforting about it and because you're watching it within the comfort of your own home you kind of get that thrill of the horror but without the actual danger element. Yeah of course it depends it really at least as a kid it really depended on what I was watching you know Mm. like if I saw like the blob you know i was like okay that was cool and i would go to bed but if i watched you know like halloween you know Mm. i would i would definitely like check all the doors and windows 20 times and wake up throughout the night so you know it still got me (laughs) yeah yeah and i mean when you say you were watching it from an inappropriately young age 
just how young are we talking? Honestly, I want to say I started watching stuff when I was about six. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was young. It was really young. Um, and it was not, I mean, my dad, who was the one that was letting me watch this stuff, he still was screening it a little bit, you know, like he would check to make sure it didn't look too gory. I think that's what he was more worried about was sort of how violent and gory something was. Um, but if it, if it sort of seemed okay, that's, that's where I started. And then eventually like, and it wasn't long after that, that he just was like, whatever, go ahead, watch what you want. I think he kind of figured out that I probably wasn't going to turn into a serial killer. So he felt okay about it. I mean, that, that's always a, a good one, particularly as a good indicator. parent. It's like, let's try to make sure our kid doesn't become a serial killer. You know? Yeah. It's, it's a good but, baseline. Yeah. <laughs> but did, did you know that you wanted to go into film or story writing or creating on some level from an early age too? I mean, I don't think i I don't think I saw a direct career path at an early age, but I knew that I loved I loved to write and that I loved mm. movies. Um, and I was one of those kids that failed in a lot of subjects. Um, I think mostly out of disinterest um, or just sort of not really applying myself. But whenever I had an opportunity for creative writing, I excelled because um, mm. I loved it so much. And so when I was in high school, um, I started to make short films with my friends. Um, mm. Some of them, you know, were sort of linear sort of narrative things. And a lot of it was experimental and weird. Um, some of it drug induced, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but yeah. And I think that's when I really started to kind of figure it out, you know, um, that there was, that there was a possi possibility of a career path. Um, so when I graduated high school, I immediately went to film school and also, you know, started to get internships. At, uh, at different production companies so I could kind of learn how things worked behind the scenes. Um, so my interest and my sort of pursuit were pretty immediate. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of those initial films you were making, like who, if, if anyone, did you show them to? And then like, you know, I, I guess what, what were some of these wild stories? I'm just so intrigued as to what, what did you start off writing? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> one of the first, one of the films we made was a, was a zombie sequel to Xanadu. Right. Oh my God. <laughs> that was a weird one. Um, and then the other stuff was really weird. It's funny though. We, we really only kind of watched it among my little small core group of friends. Mm. Although one of the um, one of the experimental films that I made with with one of my best friends, um, the tape, and this is dating myself, literally the VHS tape that it was made on, um, ended up getting I loaned it to a friend, and then they copied it, and then I guess it started to circulate years later in different colleges. Um, and I only know this because I was walking down the street, like in my late twenties, I think, or early thirties and someone stopped me because they recognized me from the, from my film <laughs> and they were like, Oh my God, we used to get drunk every Friday and watch your weird movie. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yeah, cult status. Um, so that was pretty funny, but yeah, otherwise I would never share it with anyone in my family. Like, no yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. And so with that particular film, have you ever found it kind of come back to haunt you? Have there been people since? No. Yeah. There's nothing, yeah. There's nothing bad in it. It's just weird. Um, and as far as I know, it's just all but vanished. I don't, I don't know if it exists anymore. I don't have it. So it's long gone, I'm sure. Yeah. So if anyone listening does have it, you can yeah, email it. Like, or, or maybe. Post it because I'm, yeah. I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I know too that one of the ways that you got started was so you, you, you started studying screenwriting at university, but then you actually dropped out of the screenwriting course because you were offered a writing job by Larry Clark. So, yeah. 
that's a pretty insane sequence of events. How how did that come about? <laughs> it was very strange. I um, so in all my spare time, I would write. You know, so I would write. I would write screenplays, just random things, random ideas that I had. Um, and I also made a short film uh, while I was still at university, and um, I ended up we had like a screening of it and the producer saw it and they approached me and, and asked me if I had any writing samples. And so I gave them a script that I had written. Um, and I didn't know why they wanted it. They didn't really tell me, but then they called me and said that Larry Clark wanted to meet me and that they had given him the script and he really liked it. And like my writing style, I can't imagine I had a writing style then, but whatever. Um, so Larry, um, after I met with him um, and the producers, they said, you know, if you write the first 60 pages and we like it, then we'll make a deal with you and you can keep going. Um, but if they didn't like the work, then that was it. Like I was, I was done. Um, so it was kind of a, it was sort of a dicey, weird situation, but I didn't have anything to lose. And I, and I recognized what a cool, potentially great opportunity it was. Um, so I just jumped all over it and luckily they liked it. They were happy. I kept going. They made a deal. I, they made the movie, which was even more shocking. Um, and I, I was still in school at the time, even when the, when the film came out and I was trying to juggle um, my schooling and also the suddenly having like a gig, you know, and mm. people wanting me to work. Um, and so I just decided to drop out, which made my mom freak out. Right. Um, and, but it was what I wanted to do, you know, and I was able to get an agent and I started to get hired to do some stuff. Um, so that's kind of where things began. It was short lived, um, because I was green and I, I think people quickly realized I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I, I, it was like a big moment where I was like, you know, 19, 20 years old with my, with a film out and, you know, people hiring me. And then all of a sudden they were like, Oh, he's 19 or 20 and he's an idiot. So, um, and so that was it. So like after a couple of years, like I had no career anymore. So I just kind of stopped and started to figure out other stuff to do until I found my way back to writing. It is so weird as well that of course you were doing a university course to get a screenwriting gig, but then you ultimately had to drop out of university because you had one. It's like, that's not the way. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, I think the, the university thing wasn't necessarily, I mean, there was only so much they could teach you. Mm. And that was the thing I, think I really understood the most was that I, I quickly realized that my best education was going to be outside of that, that classroom mm. and outside of that environment and in the field. Um, and so, the job itself was an education for me and the internship too, because, um, you know, that's all I did for those companies was read screenplays all day mm. long and evaluate them. And so that for me was the best education I could have gotten, um, because I was learning what worked and what didn't on the page. Um, so that was super helpful. Yeah. And so then for those starting out screenwriting as someone who has read a hell of a lot of screenplays, what are some of the things that are kind of indicators like, okay, this, this is going to be a good one and equally what are indicators like, yeah, th this screenplay is not going to work. The first three pages, honestly, you can tell like in the first three pages, if this is something that's going to at least be well written, it may not necessarily mm. be the kind of story that I like, yeah. you know, but you can get a sense that this, you're in good hands. Mm. Um, and that I was able to always recognize fairly quickly. It was very rare that a script was kind of poorly written for the first, you know, 15, 20 pages and it suddenly turned a corner and got great, you know? Yeah. Um, so that was definitely something that I was able to recognize, but also really learning about sort of that writing, that screenwriting didn't have to be so dull and functional, you know, mm. in its approach that it be more literary you know mm -hmm. there were all these rules that they were trying to shove down my throat at school about like you can't put anything on the page that isn't on the screen and all these other kinds of rules and that turned out to not be true you know mm -hmm. that um 
that you needed to entertain the reader while you were taking them through your story um, and that there was a way to do that. So that was definitely something else that I kind of started to learn from other writers, yeah. you know? Um, so that was a big help. Yeah. And then just to give us a sense of the timeline. So of course, Disturbia came out in 2007. So mm -hmm. at what point was it that you were working with Larry and then kind of what, what happened for you to then get the Disturbia gig? Yeah, that was another kind of weird road because after, after my nosedive, career wise, you know, I went off and started to, like I said, I, I started to get other jobs. Then eventually I moved to, to Texas. Um, and I was about to start studying to get my real estate license. Um, cause I was like, Oh, I'm just going to sell houses here in mm -hmm. Texas. Um, and then because I was living there on my own and I didn't know anybody and I was really lonely. I wrote a pilot, which I've never done before. I'd never written anything on the TV side. And it was about, it was sort of my sort of spin on the invisible man. Um, and so I wrote a pilot and then I sent it to a friend of mine who was a producer. Um, and I sent it to her really as like a, I, I think I even wrote in the email something like, can you read this and just tell me how bad I am? <laughs> <laughs> um, because I hadn't written anything in a while. Um, and I just, I, I was very excited about the idea, but at the same time I thought, well, this is probably bad and, and not worth anyone's time, but I want, I wanted to get somebody to verify it for me. Um, and then she didn't, I didn't hear from her for weeks. And so I thought, Oh God, it was bad. <laughs> like she can't even call me back now. <laughs> um, and then, and then about three weeks later she called me and she said, uh, she said, I hope you don't mind, but I sold it. Um, and I was like, what? So she had sold, she had sold the pilot to CBS. Mm -hmm. So I had to come back to LA and I wasn't permanently back in LA. I was sleeping on my sister's couch, mm -hmm. um, which I'm sure she hated. And I, um, and while I was waiting to kind of find out if this show was going to happen, I, I started to write Disturbia. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a spec script. Um, it was just an idea that I had. I was driving, I was sitting in traffic and there was a story on NPR about Martha Stewart on house arrest. And that was what sort of sparked the idea. Mm -hmm. um, so I wrote it and then it's funny because the show didn't go, didn't happen. They didn't make it, but then I sold Disturbia um, and that did. And that actually happened quickly. Like they made that movie very quickly after I wrote it. Um, and that was what kind of ultimately brought me back to to writing and and made me realize okay i think i'm on to something here like i'm maybe i'm better than i than i thought i was um and so i started to write again as a career yeah yeah and i know that you've described disturbia as a kind of hitchcock meets john hughes so i mean that's a hell of an elevator pitch on its own like okay <laughs> what's going on here yeah, it was funny because it seemed so obvious to me, you know, and sometimes mm. the best ideas are mm. and to the point where you where you try and research to find out like, well, how many of these movies exist already, you know, and then you find out, oh, wait, there, are, there aren't any. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think, you know, what, while, whilst it's tonally di different to, let's say, like Happy Death Day and Freaky, I think you can certainly see those ingredients coming together, particularly with the kind of dark overall theme, but then interspersing with elements of comedy. Like, I, I can't imagine, you know, you're not including at least little bits of humor within your film. It just seems to be like part of your signature. It is for sure. I always, I always include humor and in everything, even in the paranormal movies. Mm. Uh, I tried to infuse as much humor as I could. I think it's a really great way to, to disarm your audience, to endear them to your characters. You know what I mean? If you can laugh with someone, then, you know, it's the kind of person you want to hang out with, you know, and maybe spend a couple hours with them. Um, and so that's always been kind of my, my not so secret weapon. I think. Yeah. Um, I try to write characters that I think are 
relatable and funny and people you want to hang out with. Yeah. Well, I mean, particularly with paranormal activity, the marked ones, there's so much humor at the start that, I mean, it is a little bit disconcerting because anyone who's familiar with paranormal activity, we know the kind of things that are coming, but you really lull us into this false sense of security. Yeah, it's funny. When we when we did our first test screening of that movie at Paramount, um, it was such a thrill for me because I was so used to being rewarded with screams, mm. you know, in my movies. And of course I would hear people laugh and stuff, but like the first 20 minutes of that movie played like a full blown comedy where people were roaring with laughter over all the things that were happening. And I don't know, it was a real boost for me in some ways. Cause it, it was also like a, a signal to me that like, Oh, I could probably do something else besides, horror if I wanted. Um, and I think that was kind of in a weird way, the sort of genesis of me really leaning into the horror comedy aspect of filmmaking. Cause I was like, I think I can do both. Mm. Um, yeah. And so that's why the next film that I did right after that was scouts, um, yeah. which was a full blown, you know, horror comedy. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, with paranormal activity, do you remember your, reaction to the original film i do 100 percent do it was it's interesting because i actually got to see the film years before anyone else i had was working on another project with jason blum at the time and and his producing partner at the time this guy um called me this guy steven schneider and he called me and he said hey i found this weird movie that I think you're going to dig. And Steven was a big horror nut. Like a, he wrote books on, on horror. He's like a guru. And so he and I were very connected that way. And so he said, Hey, I'm going to show it to Jason at his house tonight. You should come over and watch it. Um, so I did, I went over and I think Jason was seeing it for the first time with me. Um, and we watched it and it ended and my heart was racing. And I remember turning to them and I was like, I don't know what the fuck that was, but it scared the shit out of me. Like, you got to figure this out. You got to do something with it. And then it's ironic because, you know, they had sold it to Paramount not long after, but then Paramount was going to throw the film out and start over because they were like found footage. This is weird. We don't want to do this. So they started to develop like a traditional movie out of it. And then one of the executives at Paramount, Ashley Brooks, really pushed hard for them to test Oren's movie with a real mm. audience. And when they finally saw it with like an audience and how big the reaction was, that's when they realized, oh, this is this is something special. We need to stay here. Um, and then I just accidentally found my way back into that franchise later after they were trying to make the sequel and they were trying to do it without a script. They had no script. They had like a, like a, like a treatment kind of, it was very thin. Um, but that's how Orrin made the original, you know, like he just kind of was winging it. And so they thought they could do it a second time and quickly realized they couldn't. And they had to shut production down after like three weeks because they had nothing. Um, they had a really good cast, but they just didn't have a story. And they did a writer's round table and I was invited to it. And everybody was like patting the studio on the back and saying, wow, this is going to be great. This is really good. And then the head of the studio looked at me and he was like, why are you frowning? Why are you folding your arms? And I was like, cause you guys are in trouble. I was like, this is not good. This is not going to work. You can't do it this way. And then I pitched a sequence in the movie where Christy gets dragged out of the nursery and down the stairs in the room. And the head of the studio pulled me aside after that meeting. And he said, will you go home and write that for me? And I was like, all right, sure. What the hell? So I wrote it. And then I guess they all shared it with each other. And they were like, we should hire him to like, keep going. So they brought me on at that point. And that's how I got involved with that, that whole franchise. It was an accident, like most of my career. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's showing as well, the power of just being honest. You know, you had people watching this and just nodding like, oh yeah, this is really good. And you're like, no, it's not. <laughs> there is a problem here. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a thing that I've really tried to stick to in my career and sometimes mm -hmm. to my detriment. Um, but I don't think 
faking it or kissing ass or brown nosing just because you think that's what you're supposed to do in a room yeah. like that is the way to go. And it's not that I want to, I don't set out to be insulting or to diminish somebody else's work. Um, but in a situation like that, I'm not going to sit in a room and pretend like everything's fine and, you know, it's all great. I think a lot of films end up really damaged as a result of that kind of thinking, you know, where people are afraid to tell the truth or afraid to be honest about how, what, you know, what time it is. Um, and I certainly want that from people with me, you know, like when I show my films to, to audiences and test screenings and stuff, I want the truth. I want their unvarnished opinion. Mm. You know, I want to know what sucks and you know what works. And so it's the only way to make something better is to get honest feedback. And I think a lot of filmmakers start to kind of wall themselves in. Um, and then their movies start to suck because they yeah. get too powerful and they get too big. And then there's nobody that's telling them this is bad. And thank goodness with Paranormal Activity that they kept it as a found footage film. I mean, that's one of the things that makes it so special, like particularly, you know, with the original, because like the Blair Witch Project, I think when it came out, there there were genuinely people who were a bit confused as to like, hang on, is is this real? They thought it was Did real. this actually happen? Is is this a film or is this not, what is going on here? And obviously, if you'd have just made it as a traditional film, then you couldn't have got any of that. Yeah, it's true. And it, it geniusly blurred that line for people. You know, even even I had people when two came out, I had mm. some random people ask, like, was it real? <laughs> I'm like, no. Yeah. Not real. yeah, for you as a filmmaker and screenwriter, what do you think are some of the advantages and disadvantages of writing a found footage film within horror? I mean, it was a lot of disadvantages, if I'm being honest. Um, I mean, from a writing standpoint, um, I mean, the disadvantage was I wrote full screenplays for every movie, but no one believed it. <laughs> right. So like, as, as a career thing, it really did nothing for me because no one thought the movies were written. They didn't give me any credit, really, even though I had on-screen credit. Yeah. Um, they just kind of thought we were making it up as we went along and everything was improvised and they didn't get that. Like, no, I wrote all that dialogue and like, it was all me. Um, and, but on the directing side, you know, cause they're hard movies to make and they're hard movies to write and they're hard, hard movies to make because, you know, you don't have traditional coverage and you don't have a score. Um, and you don't have all these kinds of elements and things that help you tell a story and you have to justify why there's a camera when there should be a camera. And so, um, but what I loved about making the movies was, was embracing the improv side of things, you know, and being really nimble, um, and learning how to be very economical from a storytelling point of view. So there was a lot of interesting things that inf informed how I work now when I was on those sets and when I made those movies. Um, although it was really funny because when I made Scouts, um, I had been in the found footage world for so long. Like it was very hard for my brain to change gears and switch back to traditional filmmaking. Where I was like, oh, I need to have like a master shot and then I need to like get coverage. <laughs> I need to like, I can shoot all these things. And it really was, my brain wasn't getting it um, for a minute, but it, I finally came around, came back to it. Yeah. So in fact, the adjustment back <laughs> to traditional filmmaking was in some ways harder than, you know, starting out writing fan footage. Yeah, it was. It really was. Well, I know that I would be remiss and people would be angry with me if I didn't at least talk a little bit about Happy Death Day. And I mean, what what do you think it is that is so universally appealing about the kind of groundhog day time loop story i think it's wish fulfillment you know i think a lot of people imagine like to imagine the things that they do differently if they had the opportunity you know and i think that's what that type of of device does you know it's it allows you to take inventory of yourself in a lot of ways like and that's what tree does in the movie you know she starts yeah. out as this very unlikable very unhappy young woman and then as she 
slowly tries to sort of solve the mystery of her own murder, she starts to really look at herself and her life and go, okay, well, you know, I'm kind of a terrible person and how can I correct that? Um, and so I think people were really drawn to that idea, you know, that we're redeemable, you know? Um, and that was, I think, a, a it was unusual too for a movie like this because slasher films, traditionally the final girl is like chaste and perfect and sweet and just kind of runs around until she finally, you know, kills the bad guy at the end. And Tree was allowed to be complicated and flawed and, you know, slept around and drank and was mean to people. And like, she was everything that most final girls aren't. Um, but her arc allowed her to transform and it allowed her to have total agency, you know, and that was something else that was really appealing to me was that she wasn't some passive girl running through the woods. You know, she was like, she was on it. She was on her own case and trying to solve her own murder and also trying to become a better person. So I think it really kind of was a movie that for me at least was really trying to sort of re-examine and reorient the final girl trope. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, continuing with the idea of wish fulfillment, if you could reset a time, is there a period you would go back to and start over? It's funny, you know, I, I would say no. Mm. Um, I don't want to, I would not want to relive or be stuck in the same day. Yeah. Um, because I like, I like the forward movement. Um, and I think honestly, that question is what happy death day two was about. Mm. Um, it was really about, okay, so sure, maybe you can change the past, but should you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is really no. Like the things that happened to you in your life were meant to happen. You know, they inform who you are as a human being. And um, to change any of that would be to change you, you know, mm -hmm. um, fundamentally. And so that was, that's why I made that sequel, um, because I wanted to talk about that. Um, so, and it's something that like, you know, there's a, a really good Stephen King book. Um, it's the, the book about the Kennedy assassination. Um, oh yes. Yeah. 11, And that book yeah. talks a lot is, is very involved in that kind of thinking, you know, like, sure, you could go live in a different time and find love and all these things, but you know, those kinds of changes sort of alter the course of the future and, you know, usually not in a good way yeah so yeah and i know that you have an idea for a third in the happy death day series is there anything you can say about it or is there any movement <laughs> on that front i mean it's funny like i saw you know it's been circulating again since i've been doing some press for who you have a ghost and um i saw someone tweet like if he does sci-fi again, I don't want it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I've got some really bad news for you because the third movie was going to be a combination of sci-fi mm -hmm. heist and apocalyptic disaster movie. <laughs> so, um, so it was going to be a lot of different things again. You know, the last thing I, on earth I'm interested in doing is giving anyone the same movie again you know what i mean like mm -hmm. i don't need to make another happy death day slasher movie doesn't mean that i wouldn't have elements of that in the third movie but i i'm not in the business of making sequels to make to make money or to just just blandly service some kind of like fan desire if i don't have an emotional connection and a reason to make that movie i won't make it mm -hmm. um so but you know, in this case, it's just been a, it's been a, it was a tricky thing because the second movie wasn't as successful as the first, financially speaking, even though it was, it was very successful. Um, but I think from the studio's point of view, it didn't justify the third movie for them. Um, and I, you know, it's a total bummer. And I think that we've actually sort of managed to gain a lot of fans over the years. And so I think that it would be a bigger audience if we were given the chance. Um, but 
I'm not in control of that, you know, so I have no say in it. And, you know, it's really in, in Universal's court and it's up to Jason Blum and Universal to decide if they actually want that third movie or not. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. My hands are tied. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that as well, Happy Death Day feels a lot more violent than it actually is. Because you obviously take us right up until the moment of her death and then cut away. Whereas with yeah. Freaky, you know, you're like, right, we are going all out. I mean, goodness, particularly the Alan Ruck death, which might be <laughs> gleefully <laughs> over the top. Yeah. Yeah. It was story. But I mean, how did it? feel kind of making something where it, it kind of feels violent but it actually isn't if you play it back and in in a similar way even though obviously a radically different film to the original texas chainsaw massacre you have this illusion or this memory that wow it's a, a, a super violent film but when you look at it it's like no it's not it really isn't it's all about the power of the mind so was that something that you were very conscious of going in and did you kind of need to get this PG 13 rating? It's funny. I had written it. Um, I don't, I'm not a credited writer, but I had rewritten the movie extensively. Um, the first one and I wrote it, I wrote the deaths to be really violent mm. um, because I thought we would shoot it. Um, and then when I was in early, early pre-production on the film, I remember, you know, Jason um, and the studio and they said, hey, how do you feel about it being PG-13? Um, and initially I was like, oh God, terrible. Why would I ever do that? Um, but then I really did think on it and I was like, wait a minute, it actually makes more sense story-wise mm -hmm. for us to actually not see the aftermath of her death like we should be taken right up to the edge of it so i actually went back and rewrote it um and changed that because i was like this is actually better and it honestly wasn't like oh i'm being forced to make a pg-13 movie um it just made more sense to me and i knew that i would be forced to be more suspenseful and i would have to be a little bit more creative in how i shot these these sequences and I was excited by it. I thought it made more sense and I thought it needed to be a less gory, more suspense and sort of romance forward movie, you know, because I just thought it was better that way. Um, but that's why when I made Freaky, I was like this kind of concept, this kind of body swap concept where, you know, a young sort of shy girl swaps with a serial killer. I was like that has to be gory mm. because it only succeeds if we see her doing the most horrible violent things to people you know and so that that's why we went into that movie without any questions about what rating we were going for in fact i wanted to push it as far as we could i wanted to have to power wash the ceiling of the gymnasium after we killed alan ruck yeah um which we did yeah um so yeah the rating is it's very specific to to the sort of the temperament and personality of a movie um yeah and i'm glad i didn't i'm glad i didn't make happy death day r i think it would be a different movie and mm. i think i don't think it would be a better movie yeah yeah and i mean the the kind of physical acting of vince vaughn in freaky is up there with the absolute highlights and and in fact similar to with we have a ghost when you have the physical acting of david harbour as you you've got you know two very imposing characters that are effectively having a lot less dialogue and and for vince i mean he's effectively having to embody what like a, a 15 16 year old girl but he he just absolutely yeah nails it and pulls it off so well yeah i mean it's so funny too because you look at these two very different roles mm. you know um vince vince is vince's sort of like absolute ultimate weapon is his ability to be sharp and quick 
mm. and talk. <laughs> you yeah. know, like Vince is a talker in a great way. Um, and it's kind of his trademark. And so it was so perfectly suited for like a teenage girl in a weird mm. way. Um, there very few actors that had that ability to be funny, but also empathetic um, and and also physically imposing. You know, mm. like Vince is six four, I think. Mm. Um, and so I knew I wanted that physicality for the role. Um, and so he was kind of like, he checked every box and there were very, very, very few actors out there that I believed could do it. Um, but I knew he could. Um, and so it's so interesting to see his performance up against David Harbour's mm -hmm. performance in, in We Have a Ghost because David for me is sort of the opposite of mm -hmm. Vince in many ways, you know, like he's, he's got this kind of wounded, um, quality to him and he's so expressive without words you know mm. like i think that that's something that i think i always i think david disappears into these these character he's really a character actor mm. and has a, such an extensive theater background um so he likes that you know um and so it's just funny how he's he fits a role that has no dialogue versus vince who does a lot of talking mm. um so it was it's just been but they're both very big <laughs> mm. um and imposing know people so it's it's definitely been interesting to have both experiences yeah yeah and and whilst i'd love to talk about freaky a little more i know as we're coming up to the time we have together we gotta delve more into we have a ghost and i don't to kind of kick this off i'm just interested what are your own beliefs or lack thereof with regards to ghosts and the supernatural Oh, there's no lack. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I believe in them for sure. Mm -hmm. I, uh, all my friends know that I lived in, in like a, this old haunted apartment in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, Charlie Chaplin you know, built these, this studio in LA. And then he had all of these apartments made that were like, um, it was housing for his actors. Um, and then they were converted into just sort of regular apartments, but they're like kind of old. They look like weird fairy tale buildings there's like it's just very strange and i had a very nice ghost who lived in my apartment um and the first time i encountered it i was home and i was in my bed reading and i had a roommate mm -hmm. um and my roommate was a talker and so he came home and i heard him like close the door and he walked down the hall and he went into the kitchen and my bedroom window kind of was sort of adjacent to that room. And so when the light in the kitchen turned on, the light would shine through my window. So it like turned on and off and on and off. And I was like, mm. Oh fuck, is he drunk? <laughs> and then he walked up to my door and I heard him stop right outside my door. And I was sitting in bed going, Oh, please don't come in. I don't feel like talking. Yeah. Um, and then he walked away and he just walked away and that was it. And I was like, Oh, and I went to bed. So the next morning I get up and I'm, just going to get coffee and my front door opens and in walks my roommate with his bag and his dry cleaning. Like he's coming home. And I was like, yeah. what are you doing? Did you forget something? And he goes, no, I'm, I'm just getting home. And I was like, wait a minute. No, I was like, you were here last night. And he goes, no, I wasn't. I spent the night at, he had a boyfriend. He was like, I spent mm -hmm. the night at, at Brandon's house. So he had never been there. I was completely right. alone. All the lights, all the doors, all the walking, all of that. And after that, I did start to hear more things and it never felt threatening. And then I had like a girlfriend spend the night and she slept on my couch. And the next morning she was like, oh, you're so sweet for tucking me in last night. And I was like, I didn't do that. <laughs> um, so like it was, we had a friendly ghost in our apartment. Um, and then after that, like when I started to really like get into the paranormal franchise, we would bring experts on. Mm. Um, we had one guy in particular who was a professor um, of, of like parapsychology at UCLA. And he told me stories, like really scary stories of some mm. of the stuff that he encountered. And he's not like a quack. This isn't like some guy that seems mentally, ins in fact, he had his own list of criteria when he would investigate hauntings in people's homes. Like he would go to their, he would meet them in a public place first, like a coffee mm. shop. And because he was psychologically evaluating them um, without them knowing it. And then if he felt like they passed the test 
and he would go to their house, he would make them stay outside and he would walk the house himself because he was not looking for a ghost. He was checking for loose venting, you know, or mm. a draft that could be coming from something. Like he was looking for all the logical reasons why a person might think they had a ghost, but didn't. Um, but he said he had encountered things on a couple occasions, but he actually quit that job and became a professor when he was attacked. Like he went to some woman's house and she was really scared and said there was something really bad in her house. And he said that he opened a closet and something grabbed him by the throat and pushed him against the wall and told him to get out mm -hmm. and he was done. And so like, that still gives me the chills. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I buy it. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you ever try and look into the origin of your friendly ghost? Like try and find out like, you know, what was going on there? No, it was too hard because there were so many people that had lived in that building. I mean, it had been there for a hundred years practically. And so like it was, there was so much turnover that I just really didn't know how I would figure that out. And I think I tried to just be content with that. It was like not trying to kill me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I imagine your friend was pretty freaked out when he revealed like, I wasn't the one who took you in at night. It's like, holy shit, I'll find a different yeah, couch was, to was, sleep on. <laughs> yeah, she didn't spend the night again. I'm not sure. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. But I mean, I know that one of the inspirations for We Have a Ghost was a uh, vice story called Ernest. So how did you first read that one? Um, so it was a short story that was sent to me by my, my agent at the time. Mm. Um, and he had really good taste in, in literature. And he, he sent it to me and said, Hey, I think you're going to really like this. And it was more like, mm. a, it wasn't like you should turn this into a movie. He really sent it to me like, you'll enjoy this read. Yeah. Um, but when I read it, I was really struck by it and sort of felt like I knew what the movie was right away. Mm. Um, and so I really pursued it aggressively. Um, and once I was able to get the rights and set it up, I kind of just went straight to work on, on writing the movie and, you know, adapting that, that short story. It was great because it felt like such a cool jumping off point for a movie. Um, I really like the characters. I like the sort of social media lens that it was mm. looking at a ghost story through. I thought that was really unique. Um, and it felt like a modern kind of Amblin-y movie to me, or at least the potential to be that, you know? Um, and it also was a vessel for me to explore a lot of different themes that I've been interested in and wanted to kind of examine in a movie like this. So it just kind of, it was just kind of like the right, the right thing at the right time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this story as well, like the Vice story, it does have that similarity to Paranormal Activity in the sense that it's like, is this a story? Is this an article? Did mm -hmm. this actually happen? Like it, it's yeah. very kind of just like matter of fact about it. So it does blur that yeah. line, which, which I love. Yeah, that's how Jeff wrote it, which I, I think it's part of its charm. Mm. is that it is very matter of fact like so there's a ghost in this guy's house and this is what he decided to do um and but again it's it's a sneaky story too because it focuses very much on on the father character frank mm. um and how he kind of thrusts his family into the limelight um and how he's really abusive to the ghost you know mm. um and that his son very very quietly in the background befriends the ghost you know mm. and for me that was where that's where i saw the focus pull for the movie i was like oh this movie is about the kid it's not yeah. about the dad um and so that's where i started you know i really tried to so like even in the in the movie in the book version frank finds the ghost first mm. um but in the movie version kevin does um because I kind of wanted it to be his story and it, like wanted it to be a secret he's trying to keep that of course he can't. Um, and so that was kind of the starting point for me. And then just, just about trying to sort of figure out, okay, so how is there, how do we add a story engine here? Like what's, what's, what does Ernest want or need? Mm. Um, and how is Kevin going to help him figure that out? And of course for me it was, okay, he doesn't remember anything. He doesn't even know why he's in this house. 
Mm. Um, and so there's a history that I was able to kind of build out um, and then also add kind of this sort of external threat, you know, with this sort of shadowy government agency pursuing them. And so it kind of allowed it to give it some of that kind of fun ET-ish kind of mm. stuff. Um, but then ultimately really just a movie about, about, it sounds corny, but like feeling seen, um, mm. about finding unusual friendships about fatherhood. Um, you know, I have two kids of my own. And so there was a lot I wanted to explore about my relationship with my kids and also mm. my relationship with my dad who passed away when I was 16. Mm. Um, so there was a lot to unpack there for me. And it was just nice that I had this really fun Trojan horse, you know, to do it in. Um, so that's, that's, we have a ghost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you have packed perhaps more into this story than any other film. I mean, there are so many layers to it. Obviously you're talking about exploring the family dynamic, but you've also got things about you know, human rights and how certain people are treated like they're less than human. You've got the obsession with social media and validation and how that can obviously go too far when you're just click kind of uh, chasing clicks or chasing money. And then, of course, you've got what is unfortunately probably a very realistic reaction as to how the cia would be if there was ever a ghost actually discovered to a point where it could be captured right. um we haven't even mentioned you know jennifer coolidge and obviously the the kind of parody of the the fake medium and <laughs> yeah like i love that scene too it's like well Let's have some fun with her. Let's let's yeah. get Ernest to act as a well. in your movie. You better do something good with her. Yeah, I, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I really. It's funny. Like, I one of the things that I love to do in my films is obviously blend genres, you know, and even some tones. I try not to go too wild off the sort of the, the tone front, but um, I do believe that you can make a movie that is a family adventure and an action movie and a horror movie and a sci-fi movie and a romance, you know, mm. I, can, I don't believe that there's anything, any reason why you can't put them all together in one film, as long as you are very much on a specific journey with a specific character. And that's what Kevin is. Um, and so it allows you to kind of move through these different, these different spaces because you're always following the same person, you know, um, so I, like I said, I'm a big fan of, of, of kind of maximizing my genres. Um, mm -hmm. The film, and this really was, for me, my, my best opportunity to sort of kind of keep one foot planted in my past and specifically the sort of my horror roots, but also really show people that I have another side of myself, you know, that can make a bigger movie you know a more action focused movie um you know a movie with much more scale because i spent a lot of time obviously in the in the blumhouse kind of lower budget world um and it's easy to stay there you know it can be really comfortable to stay there but i wanted to challenge myself and do something bigger and so this was this was the right movie i think for that yeah yeah and i love too how you invert expectations and tropes and of course even the introduction to Ernest you know you've got him being like woo and obviously everyone's meant to freak out but Kevin is just laughing at him like what the hell is going on which I I, I almost feel is is a more realistic reaction to what's actually happening here like what, what the fuck well, is yeah, that I mean, meant to do <laughs> kind of like when I've sh when I would like show some of like my nieces and nephews old horror films that I loved yeah. that like, scared the shit out of me when I was a kid and yeah. they watch it and they're like, what? <laughs> yeah. That scares you. And that's kind of what Ernest is doing in that scene. Like he's just sort of like this dusty old, he's been doing, he's been playing this trick for, for decades. Mm. And it's only been effective because he's been dealing really with sort of like the, audiences that haven't been exposed to the really hardcore stuff, you know, but like he's dealing with a family in a post 
conjuring post you know evil dead post whatever world where like yeah this kid's, this kid's way more cynical and way more you know savvy to this stuff and so to him it just looks goofy yeah uh, and that was kind of the fun and the joke of it you know is that like he thinks he's being scary but he's just being bad yeah yeah and i mean like like unfortunately ag again pretty realistic it's like he starts off non-threatening but then the media of course turn him into a monster because that's what they expect that's almost what they want and we i don't know we just see this kind of thing too much where somebody's got a narrative about a person or a situation and then they will manipulate it so that it looks as if their narrative is truth yeah it's true we definitely i mean that was part of why i had such a good time putting in this little social media montage in the mm. film because i was able to use Ernest as this sort of example of how how divisive things are now how how everybody there's so much tribalism and how we all kind of immediately go to our separate quarters mm. and start flinging mud at each other and it's like yeah. they, they can't even take a ghost seriously and 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 not make it about like other things you know political things you know that are mm. like ridiculous um and so it's kind of like a it's it's a really funny part of the movie for me, but also a really sad part yeah. of the movie as well, because it's true. Well, what is it that you're working on at the moment? At the moment, I am hopefully, feels like it's happening, gearing up to go and remake Arachnophobia. For oh. Amblin. So oh. I'm, really, I'm very excited about that. I'm very afraid of spiders. Mm. Um, I actually, they had a, the other day I went to Amblin and they had a, a, a spider wrangler um, come and he like brought <laughs> all these different species of spiders. And I even had one put on me, which I was just absolutely terrified. Mm -hmm. um, but it was almost like exposure therapy, you know? Right. I, I think they were like, this guy, you're going to need to like get comfortable here if you're going to do this. Um, but it was really cool. And um, yeah, and I'm super excited. I love the original. Um, mm -hmm. I, saw, I saw it on opening weekend in the theater when I was a kid yeah, um, and it scared the crap out of me. And it was such a fun thrill ride. I intend to accomplish the same thing, but in a different way. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that one. All right. Well, thank you for spending some of your evening chatting with me. This is absolutely- Thank you for waking up at the butt crack of dawn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On your side. <laughs> Yeah, no, this has flown by and I'd love to do it again sometime and get a little bit deeper as well into the, the writing and the mechanics. But I mean, Absolutely. yeah, wh where can our listeners connect with you? Um, I am on social media, that the hellscape of, <laughs> of social media. If you want to find me there, I'm on Instagram, uh, the Chris Landon. Um, I'm on Twitter where I routinely chat with people and sometimes people try and punch me in the face there. Um, <laughs> um, but that's a, that's a creature, creature show or creature. I can't even remember my own handle, but I'm on there. You can find me. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, those are, that's, that's it. I'm not a Facebook guy and I'm not, I'm too old for TikTok. I think that's, that would be embarrassing. Um, right. So I'm not doing that. Um, but yeah, that's where I am. You can find me there. All right. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? Um, watch my movie on Netflix, February 24th. I really, I really hope that a lot of people see it. I'm really proud of it. I worked really hard on it and went through a lot of crazy shit to make it. Um, and it's a true labor of love. Um, so I really, I hope people check it out. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. And I think, and I hope that it's going to bring you a wider audience because, yeah, it's going to appeal to people who are into ghost stories and horror. But I think, too, that this is one that you can actually watch with the family as well. Yeah, I know. It's a first for me. I've, I've had to do press for like family outlets, which has been a total shock <laughs> Yeah, for me. I'm like, who are you people? Um, but yeah, it's definitely, uh, you know, 
family friendly above a certain age. I don't think I could let my, I have a son, he's five. So he's right. not quite ready yet, even though he's seen a lot of it. Um, but I think seven, yeah. seven and up, you know, is good. There you go. So your son in a couple of years can have yeah, the treat close. of watching. The he's he's going to see Gremlins before he sees my movie. So right. that, that's yeah. already my plan. Gremlins, what a great initiation. <laughs> Perfect one. There's no better one. So I've been priming him. I've been showing him pictures and like, oh yeah. <laughs> like this is the cute Mogwai. This is the Gremlin. He's yeah. really into it. He already wants to watch it, but I know I need to wait. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast of Christopher Landon. Join us again next time when we will be chatting with Eric LaRocca. But if you would like to get that ahead of the crowd, if you would like to get every episode ahead of the crowd, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only do you get early bird access to each and every episode, but you can submit questions to each guest that we have on the show. And we're actually talking to Eric LaRocca again at the end of the week. You see, we recorded the first part last weekend, and the second part, as I say, we will be recording this weekend. So if you have a question for Eric, then you can submit it at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. We've got a number of other guests coming up soon, including the likes of Jordan Harper, Joe R. Lansdale, Victor Laval. Grady Hendrix, and Caroline Kepnes, to name but a few. And it's also the best way to support the podcast, so if you get value out of this horror podcast, and you would like to give back to us, then do go over to patreon.com forward slash thisishorror, have a little look at the options, and see if it's a good fit for you. Okay, before I wrap up, it is time for a quick advert break. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them, and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The girl in the video is the ring meets fatal attraction for the iPhone generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. Horror on Main, a new weekend convention for the horror community. Exploring all the shadows of horror, our guests include writers and actors, but also artists, publishers, directors, composers, and more. We've been going to cons for over 20 years and are changing up the little things to make the big picture amazing. Beyond guests, contests, movies, panels, and podcasters, our layout and programming are designed to further incorporate the very idea of community. Join us Memorial Day weekend 2023 in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Come to the block party and meet your new neighbors. HorrorOnMain.com As always, I would like to end with a quote. And once again, I am going for something from one of the Stoics and... Really, because I think Stoicism is so informative in terms of living the good life. I think it's one of the finest philosophical schools of thought. And this particular quote is from Seneca, who said, It is not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare that things are difficult. I'll see you in the next episode with Eric LaRocca. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.